Hey, good morning. Welcome to Catalyst Online. Really glad that you are hanging out with us today. My name is Jason, one of your pastors here, and a few things I want to let you know about as we kick our service off uh, to make sure you're totally in the loop and to provide just a good experience for you this morning. One is this. If you're new and joining us for the first time, do us a huge favor. Do yourself a favor. Uh, Let us know that you're hanging out with us together online. And the way that you can do that is you can text Catalyst SP to 97000. What happens at that point is you will be texted back a link to our digital connect card. And that is a great way uh, to let us know that you are joining us today. It's a great way to pass on information to us. If you have questions, if you have prayer requests, if you'd like to connect with one of the pastors, that is your primary way of doing that. Again, texting Catalyst SP to 97000. A couple things we're real excited about. Today, we're kicking off a brand new series. We're calling it The Core, and it is a, a series that's really based upon the core, what, it, what the core uh, principles and the core values of being a follower of Jesus Christ are. So we're going to be going through that series for the next several weeks together, and we're really excited about what that's going to mean, not only in our lives as a church, but your life too uh, as a follower of Christ. I want to give you a little bit of a heads up that after the sermon this morning. We're going to be doing communion together. So make sure that you run and you grab your bread, your juice, uh, so you can join us in communion after the message. And then also want to let you know that next week on January 12th, 13th and 14th, we're having our Zoom church family meeting. And what that is, it's your opportunity uh, to hear from us about uh, what the budget looks like for 2021, where we're going staffing-wise, where we're going visions-wise, where we're going planning-wise. Uh, just a good opportunity for us to have conversation with you about that. So again, that's on the 12th, the 13th, or the 14th on Zoom. You only need to pick one. And you can sign up for that on the Catalyst Church Center app. Again, if you haven't downloaded that, you got to download the Catalyst Church Center app. Lastly, I want to let you know that today, registration is going live for our C groups. We've got a variety of groups to choose from. We've got mixed groups. We've got men's groups. We've got women's groups. We've got in-person, socially distanced groups. We have Zoom groups. Guys, this is really a great Uh, next best step for you to take because I really think it's super important in the season we're living in that we still continue to remain as connected as we can. And fortunately, we got a lot of different unique ways that we can do that. And not only connected relationally, but connected relationally and having intentional conversations about things of faith. I think it's going to be so important for our health moving forward in this year. So make sure you check out on the Church Center app because that's our primary location for registering for groups. Check out the Church Center app. You'll see the different options. As the days and weeks move ahead, we'll probably add a few more as we go. But I want to make sure that you are aware that group registration goes live today. One thing we're trying to do each week when we hang out with you online is share some cool stuff that's going on in our community, in our church community, in our church family. And we got a video for you right now that's going to give you a little bit of an update on a really exciting building project that's going on here at the church campus. And it is the renovation of our youth room. Obviously, you guys know Pastor Trevor. He has done an amazing job with his team of volunteers to develop just a really uh, effective, vital uh, youth ministry for the junior high and high school students of this town. And now we've got a great opportunity to uh, uh, create a space just for them. They've been meeting in the past. They've met in the sanctuary. They've met in the fellowship room. They have met on the patio. But now we're creating a space just for them. And I don't, know if, I don't know if you guys remember back to the days of being a teenager, but having your own space is a really big deal when you're a teenager. So we're going to make that possible for the teens of our community to have a space where they can gather, have a lot of fun together, Also, most importantly, hear about the good news of Jesus Christ. So Chris and Trevor are going to give you a little bit of a video tour of what that room looks like and how that you can be a part of making that happen. So take a peek. Hey there, Catalyst Church. Pastor Chris here, and I'm standing in this room with Pastor Trevor. Now, you may not recognize the space that we're standing in right now, but we are in the future home of our youth ministry. We're actually upstairs in the church building and you may not recognize this space because if you've been up here before, you realize this was a very low ceiling, like segmented room. And uh, and we are really excited as we move forward as, as a church to be able to provide a new home for our youth ministry. And so we've been in construction up here during COVID so that we can provide a new home for our youth group. And so I'm here with Pastor Trev because I want Trevor to be able to share just kind of the excitement that, that 
he has and then our youth ministry has and what the plans are for the space. So Trev? Yeah, so I mentioned it a little bit last week, but we haven't had a space for our youth group. We've kind of moved all over the church in different times, different settings, and we've always been a little too big for a classroom, but we were too small in the sanctuary. And so to have a space that we could use for youth uh, and uh, be able to, you know, have games up here, have it be an environment that they're comfortable in, a place they want to be. Uh, we just really believe it's going to be a huge help to our ministry and to our team that's that's leading our students. And so we're really excited to utilize this as a space for the youth room. And uh, yeah, yeah, we we've like you said, our youth ministry has been nomadic for the last like six years, moving from place to place, indoor, outdoor, sanctuary. They're now in the patio. And when COVID's over and we can go back to normal, we are so excited that we're going to be able to provide a home for impact and a home where we can reach more and more youth in this city, um, a space to call their own. And if you can imagine as we walk through this space here, there's gonna be a small stage with audio and video and lighting um, with a fully functioning space that hopefully not, will not only be used by youth ministry, but maybe for other Catalyst uh, larger group events as well. Um, so and as you can imagine, there's a price tag that is attached to this. Now, fortunately, we as a church have had enough in reserves to get the project started, but we're now asking you, if Catalyst Church is your home church, to partner with us. And when I say partner with us, is that we want to invite you to give above and beyond over the next six to eight weeks to help pay for this space that will become the future home for impact. The price tag that's attached to the completion of this is about $75,000. Now you may say, wow, that's a lot of money. Some of you say, well, that's not a whole lot you know, for the size of space and the renovations that we've had to do in here. But nevertheless, we're expecting the total bill to be around $75,000. The amazing and generous thing that's already happened is we've had a family within the church say that they will match any of your giving up to $25,000 here in the next six to eight weeks. So every dollar that you give for the Youth Room Project will turn into $2 until we reach the $50,000 mark. Now, our goal is $75,000, and so we hope that you will be willing to partner with us. And the way that you can do that over the next six to eight weeks is you can go to givetocatalyst.com, uh, and there will be a giving option that says Youth Room Project on there, or you can go to the Church Center app, and there will be a drop down as well. But we're asking you to give above and beyond to rebuild this space, to build a home for our youth ministry so that we can reach the next generation even more as we look forward to rebuilding um, all that God wants to do here at Catalyst Church when COVID ends. So if you want to partner with us, we invite you to do so. Thanks, Trev, for being here. We're super excited about this opportunity, guys, and we uh, look forward to all that God is going to do right here upstairs. God bless you guys. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Catalyst. All right, so very cool, exciting times here at Catalyst with the renovation of our youth room here. Again, if you'd like to be a part of that, you can go to the Church Center app and click on Give, and there's a specific portal you can click on for donating to the youth room renovation. Also, you can go to Give. Uh, slash catalyst.com if you'd like to be a part of that as well. But uh, we're so excited that we are being able to create a space for these teens to gather, uh, call maybe a home away from home, have great meaningful conversations about things of faith. So thanks for partnering in that with us. Hey there, Catalyst Church, Pastor Chris here. I am so excited to be able to bring this message to you as we begin our four-part series called The Core. And we're going to kick this series off with a profound yet troubling portion of the Bible. It's found in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. So if you have your Bibles, they're at home or wherever you're watching, I want to encourage you to open up that Bible app or open up your Bible to Colossians chapter 1 and follow along with us as we go through this critical critical, theological, dense uh, portion of scripture that informs so much of who we are at our core as Christ followers. Now, as we read through this, you're gonna, there'll be some of you watching that are going to totally disagree with this. Um, if you're new to the Bible or you're new to faith, you may read through this and go, man, I don't believe that at all. And that's totally fine. There may be others of you as you read through this that you partly agree with this. You said, man, like, I, I agree with some of these aspects of who Jesus is, but I've never heard that before. And so I don't know if, I, if that sits well with me or I agree with it or whatever. And there may be some of you that have never heard this before. 
you, you were invited to watch by a friend or you're just you know, checking us out for the very first time and you're exploring faith and you don't really know a whole lot about Jesus. Um, and so I'm so excited that if that's who you are that you're watching because this is going to really tell you exactly what the Bible says Jesus is. And there may be others of you watching who are Christ followers and you are just going to say yes and amen to every single thing in here and you're going to completely agree with it. And I think this passage, I call it troubling because I think what it does is it makes these audacious claims that are so countercultural in our day and age today. And it's going to cause us to re examine where we stand with the Jesus that's described in this passage. Because when you stand in front of something like this, when you stand in front of something that describes the magnitude of a person or the magnitude of an event, it should cause us to pause. And it should cause us to re-examine, what do I do with what I'm seeing? Or what do I do with what I'm reading? I remember uh, a summer and a half ago, so in the summer of 2019, my family got this incredible uh, opportunity to travel Europe together, just the four of us. And one of the places that we went to was Rome. And Rome is this incredibly historical, beautiful city. And obviously, when we were in Rome, we went to Vatican City. And in Vatican City are a couple of the world's greatest places to go and visit. One of them is the Sistine Chapel. And you wait in this long line to walk through because you want to go in and you want to see Michelangelo's beautiful artwork on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. It's just one of the most breathtaking and wonderful things that you can ever do in your life. And if you ever get an opportunity to go, you must go and see the Sistine Chapel. But I remember going into that with my family and you just, you, you, your, your, your neck just arches upward and you're looking at the ceiling of this wonderful building. And Michelangelo's hand painted this incredible piece of art and you're just walking through the creation account and different aspects of the Bible and you worship God while you're staring at the ceiling, almost as if you're staring up into the heavens. And so you just have this like spiritual, biblical experience looking at this and it causes you to, just, to, to, to go to a place that you weren't in before you walked into the chapel. Similarly, when you walk into St. Peter's Basilica, and you go into this incredible cathedral and you walk in and, and you see at the altar the tomb of St. Peter. Peter, the Peter of the New Testament who's buried there and his tomb still lies there. And, and as you're standing there at his tomb, you realize that, man, inside here is the Peter that walked with Jesus. The Peter that walked on water, the Peter that denied Jesus three times after his crucifixion, the, the Peter that helped lead the church in Jerusalem through the book of Acts. And you're just in awe into the magnitude of that place just kind of envelops who you are. Even more so, I had that experience when I got to see the empty tomb in Jerusalem about 10 years ago. And you're standing at what they believe to be the, the grounds of Joseph of Arimathea and, the, and his tomb in which Jesus was laid. And the, the tomb is empty. And you just sit in that, in that garden looking at this empty tomb, regardless of if it's the real place of Jesus' you know, tomb or not. But you just stand there in awe. And every single one of those becomes a spiritual experience where you have to re-examine, like, what am I doing with my life? What do I do with this, this reality that, that Peter lived, that, that Michelangelo could paint something that magnificent and, and that, that Jesus is not in the grave and you have to ask yourself, what do I do with this? Well, this passage for me, and I hope it is for you as we go through it together, will become one of those passages where you stand in awe in magnificent expectation that, that God is going to do something through it in your heart. And I hope this passage will do something similar and profound in each one of us as we walk through it today. And what it's going to do, it's going to ask you that exact same type of a question. That, what do I do with this? And the specific question that Colossians chapter 1 is going to ask us is, is Jesus Christ both my Savior and my Lord? What do I do with these statements about Jesus. 
And we hear that phrase a lot, Jesus Christ should be your personal Lord and Savior. And if you've been in the church for any length of time, I'm sure you've heard of it. You may have even declared that at some point in your life, that Jesus Christ is my Savior and he is my Lord. And we, we get that phrase from the name of Jesus himself. Jesus, his, you know, the, the formal name that we refer to him as is Jesus Christ. And Jesus is the uh, English transliteration of the Greek translation of the Hebrew word Joshua. Jesus' given name was Joshua in Hebrew. And Joshua literally means God will save. And so when we say Jesus is my savior, it's literally within his name. And so we say Jesus is my personal savior, but he's also my Lord, which is represented in the word Christ. Christ or Messiah or the anointed one of God causes us to say that he is the one that is in authority as the incarnate God that has rule and reign over our lives. And so Colossians 1 is going to say, is Jesus both your Savior and your Lord? And so at the core of who you are, let's ask ourselves that question. Is Jesus both my Savior and my Lord? And so this scripture is going to, as we walk through it, is going to ask us that critical question today. Let's walk through it now together. Colossians chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 15. And we're going to walk through this just piece by piece in our time for church online today. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15, the first statement in this where Paul is writing about the supremacy of Jesus Christ. There's something you need to know about this this before we get into it is that the Apostle Paul started off his life as one who opposed Jesus and the Jesus movement in the first century. In fact, he oversaw the the imprisonment and the killing of Christians. His job was to help squash the Jesus movement. He met the risen Christ, he converted to Christianity, and he dedicated his life to planting churches and being the missionary to tell the world that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Messiah, and that by faith in him you may have eternal life. So that radical transformation happened in Paul's life. And so, he's after he plants churches he writes letters to these churches and one of them is a letter that he's written to the church in Colossae we call it the book of Colossians and it's a letter that Paul has written from prison so Paul has nothing to gain as a prisoner in chains because he keeps talking about Jesus all the time with people and so he's been put in prison for and he writes this about Jesus with nothing to gain he's not a religious leader he's not trying to earn money he's not trying to gain fame He's doing it because he believes it and he knows that this is true. And so he starts that off in verse 15 by describing Jesus by saying the son, meaning Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. He is the image of the invisible God. Meaning the unseen God is seen in the person of Jesus Christ. We know God. We know what godliness is. And we know what godly wisdom is through the person of Jesus. God as unseen becomes seen in the person of Jesus. Paul is essentially saying, if you want to see God, if you want to know who God is, look at Jesus. Now, our world spins its wheels at trying to figure out who God is. And if you were to ask 10 of your friends, who is God? You may get 10 different answers. And our world spins because they don't know who God is. But when we look at the Bible, it specifically says that if we want to know who God is, look at Jesus. But throughout all of human history, philosophy, literature, religion, art, sociology, and spirituality have all tried to fill in the gaps to tell the world this is who we think God is or this is who we think the gods are. The world can only give us speculation But the Bible and Jesus gives us what we call revelation. It reveals who God is. And Jesus Christ, Paul says, is the image of the invisible God. That all of God's attributes are embodied in the incarnate Son, Jesus. So we say that God is merciful. We read stories about how Jesus meets a woman in adultery and shows her mercy in front of the religious leaders. We say, that we say that God is all loving. And then we look at the life of Jesus. We see that he was best friends with those who were unlovable or that were unclean or that were untouchable, the, the prostitutes and the outcasts. And he, he was embodiment of love. We say things like God is all powerful. And then when we look at the life of Jesus, we see that this all powerful God was in the flesh in Jesus to where he could cast out demons and he could raise people from the dead. 
It said that we say that God is the creator and is over all of creation. Well, we read stories about how Jesus tells the wind and the waves to cease moving, and they do. We talk about God being a healing God, and yet in the life of Jesus, he constantly healed people and healed the sick and the lame and the blind and the mute and the demon-possessed. We know that God is a, is a judging God. And we see that Jesus spoke with authority. In fact, in Matthew chapter 28, he says that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He has authority as he turns over the tables in the temple. It says that my father's house will be a house of prayer. We see in the book of Revelation that Jesus is going to come one day to judge the living and the dead. He is the judging God. We see that God, that God is an emotional God. He has feelings. Well, Jesus did too as he wept at the death of his friend Lazarus. We say that God is logical and, and, and ha, is a God of order. We see that Jesus throughout his ministry would, would debate and, and, and argue in the synagogues with people like Nicodemus in John chapter 3. So as we read the Gospels, we see that Jesus reflects the one true God. He is God in the flesh. He is the, the image of the invisible God. Now, the problem I think that the world has with this is that when they think about Jesus, they too often think about Christians. The world wants to see if the Christian faith has anything to contribute to this idea of who God is. And those of us that call ourselves Christians, little Christs, are supposed to represent Jesus with our lives. The unfortunate reality is that when the world looks at some of our lives, they're not seeing an accurate representation of Jesus, and therefore they don't see an accurate representation of who God is. And so therefore they want nothing to do with God because they want nothing to do with Christians because we've gotten in the way. So we have, a rep we have a role to play in this that we also represent Jesus well because Jesus represents the image of the invisible God. And so if you're that type of person that's exploring and saying, I want to know who God is, my, my encouragement to you is as hard as it is for me to say this is don't look at Christians. Don't look at Christians to try to figure out who God is or what it means to be a Jesus follower. Look at Jesus. Read the Gospels and the life of Christ and say, is this a man that I want to give my life to? Is this a man that I can follow for the rest of my days? Is this man worthy of my life? And so he says, the Son of Man, or the Son is the image of the invisible God. Second thing he says is the firstborn over all creation. Now, this firstborn is not, doesn't mean that God the Father and God the Holy Spirit had a kid together and so he was the firstborn. What it really means is the firstborn is like a, it's like a rank, like in the military. If you're the first officer, you're the, of highest ranking. And so Jesus, this, this speaks to Jesus' preeminence and his authority, meaning that he's top dog. He is in all authority. And so Jesus must have first rank in our lives. He must have that first position for every single one of us because he's not only the image of the invisible God, he's also the firstborn and he has preeminence and authority over every single one of us in creation, it says. Now look at verse 16. It says, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Everything was created by him, through him, and for him. John chapter 1 uh, uh, it is really where this comes from, that Jesus Christ was, was here in the beginning and that he was all a part of creation Everything was made in him and through him and by him. All the things that were visible and invisible, the wind and the waves would obey him, the demons would obey him, the thrones and the powers and the rulers and authorities, all were created by him, it says. But most importantly, do you know that Jesus created you and he created me and he created you for a purpose? You are not an accident. God has a specific purpose for your life. Jesus created you and he created you to be in relationship with him as, he, as your creator. And therefore, we're created by him. And so our lives are reflected in the way that we then say, yes, you are my creator and therefore I am yours. You are my creator, my father, and so I am your child. It says in verse 17 now that he is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. 
It says he is before all things. Again, I'm going to refer back to John chapter 1. It says, in the beginning was the logos or the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. John chapter 1, verse 1. It says that in the beginning, Jesus was there as part of who God is, and he was before all things. Jesus isn't just a created man, as some religions would say. He's not just a mere mortal. That the, We believe that the scriptures teach that Jesus was with God and was, with, was part of God from the very beginning. And he says that he was not only there before all things, but in him all things hold together. All things. Things are held together by the hands of Jesus. You know what he holds together? Everything. All things. Make Jesus Christ the Lord of your marriage and he will hold it together. Make Jesus Christ the Lord of your family and his hands will hold it together. Make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life and he will hold it together. His loving hands can and will hold together that which you and the world is trying to pull apart when you are surrendered to his power and his authority over your life. Colossians chapter 1 says, he created it and his hands hold it all together. And look what he says now in verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. He says here that in verse 18 that he is the head of the body, which is the church. This is why this value, one of our core values as a church, the first one is the word Christ. Christ is the foundation by which we build this church upon. He is the head of the church. He is our senior pastor. He is our lead elder. He is the one that is in charge of all of this. I'm not in charge of the church. Our elder team is not in charge of the church. Our staff team is not in charge of the church. You're not in charge of the church. A small group of people that are disgruntled with the church are not a part, are not in charge of the church. Jesus Christ is the head of the body of the church, it says. And we do what he tells us to do. And so our core value Our primary core value is Christ because he is the one that we are subservient to because he is the head. He is the one that makes the decisions. And so all that we do as a church, we go to him first and we say, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, what do you want from us? Where do you want us to go? What do you want us to do? And we seek his wisdom before our own worldly wisdom. And so therefore, because Christ is our first core value, our mission is built on the mission of Jesus. Our mission statement here at Catalyst is helping people far from God find life in Jesus Christ. And that is our mission because that was his mission. Because Christ is the foundation of all that we do here at this church. But Jesus is the defining centerpiece because we realize that without him, we're nothing. Without him, we're nothing. We have no gospel. We have no salvation. We have no idea what the character and nature of God is. We have no true north with our lives. And so we choose as a church, I choose as a Christ follower in the best way that I know how to make him the head of my life, the head of this church, because he's in control, it says, and he is the ultimate authority over every single one of us. And then it moves on to say he's not only the head of the body, the church, but he says he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. The firstborn from among the dead literally is referring back to his resurrection. Jesus is not dead. He is alive and he is resurrected. And Paul reminds us that, that Jesus Christ was the first and the only person in human history to be risen from the dead by the power of God. He rose himself up from the grave, proving that sin and Satan and death have no power over him. And therefore, those who are in Christ have that exact same power within us, that sin and Satan and death have no power over our lives because of what Christ has done with the resurrection. But he says he is the firstborn from among the dead, meaning everyone else is dead. You and I will one day be dead, but our souls will live in eternity, but our bodies will die. 
Every other religious leader that has ever lived in this world is dead. You can go to the tomb of Muhammad. You can go to the tomb of King David. You can go to the tomb of Mary Baker Eddy. You can go to the tomb of Joseph Smith. You can go to the tomb of the Buddha. You can go to the to the tomb of Chairman Mao. You can go to the tomb of of all of the different religious world leaders and they are still dead. But Paul declares that Jesus Christ is the firstborn from among the dead. He has risen from the grave and because he has risen from the grave, he has that authority and he has that power like no one else that has ever walked this earth has. He is the firstborn from among the dead and he is alive and active in your life, and he's active in my life, and he is active in the world in which we live in. And so he is worthy of lordship over us. And then verse 19, or it says, excuse me, verse 18, he is the firstborn from among the dead, so that, this is, underline this, the the second half of verse 18, so that in everything, in everything, he might have the supremacy. Because of who he is, he might have the supremacy, which means that he is in charge of it all. Your life, my life. He is the supreme leader and Lord over our lives when we say we want to follow him. So in everything, he has the supremacy. This is what it means for Jesus Christ to be Lord over my life. Because of who he is, he he has supremacy over my life. He becomes central to who I am. That my decisions are no longer my own. My life is no longer my own. My desires and passions are no longer my own. They're his. My will bends to his will. My passions bend to his passions. My decisions bend to his word. My family bends to his desire for our future. My marriage is bent to his will for our marriage. My financial situation and my my job bends to his will because he is supreme over it all. Jesus of the Bible is the image of the invisible God. He has all authority and he is the firstborn from a creation. He created all things and he holds all things together. He is the head of the church. He is the only one who conquered death and he is fully God. And for those reasons, we say that Jesus Christ is Lord of my life. Is he the Lord of your life? Have you surrendered your life to this Jesus? In fact, Jesus makes a pretty scary statement in Matthew chapter 7 where he says, there will be many people in the end that come to me and say, Lord, Lord, but we did lots of things for you. We prophesied in your name and we healed people in your name, but they never had a relationship with him. And so he said, I never knew who you were. You said I was Lord, but your life did not reflect it. And he says, I don't know who you are. And that's why this passage is is so profoundly offensive yet important for us to wrestle with. Because if it's true, it must inform and change the core of who we are. Is Jesus Christ Lord of your life? Now for those of you that are just seeking out faith and trying to figure out what all this means... Are you at least willing to to explore this in your own life? To maybe stop looking at the Christians on TV or the Christians around there that are are getting in the way of, of who Jesus really is. And are you willing to examine this for your own life? There was a doubter in the New Testament. You might have heard his name before. His name was Thomas. He was actually one of the original 12 disciples. And after Jesus was crucified and put into the tomb, Thomas thought that he was dead, dead. And when he found out from his friends that Jesus Christ had risen from the grave, he didn't believe it at all. And he didn't believe it until Jesus Christ came and proved himself to be real and alive to him. And when that happened, Thomas then said to Jesus, you are my Lord and you're my God. 
And my prayer is for those of you that are doubting, that you're seeking, that you're just trying to figure this out, that today you would make that same declaration that Doubting Thomas made with his friends. That Jesus Christ becomes your Lord and your God. For those of you that have been following Christ and say, yeah, Jesus is my, my Savior, but is He also your Lord? Does He have full authority and reign over your life? So Paul asked that question. I should say this, this passage forces us to wrestle with this reality. And then he moves on after verse 19. He moves on to to what we would consider to be the gospel. The true essence of how we enter into a relationship with our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ. Look at verse 20. It says, And through Him, through Jesus, to reconcile to Himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through His blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God. And you are enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. And that may be where some of you are at when you're, as you're watching now. You're saying, yeah, I'm far from God. I, I don't really know where I stand with God. That I, I don't feel like I've been reconciled to God. I don't know if I were to die tonight that I would know that I would spend eternity with my Heavenly Father. This gospel proclamation here in verse 21 says that, that you were alienated from God. That that is the true place of where you are, but the the most important word that comes in these verses is the first word of verse 22, and that's the word but. Because he says that once there were so many of you who were alienated from God and you were enemies in your minds, but now he, being Jesus, reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. The Bible says that because Jesus went to the cross and he gave his life for you, you now stand, can stand before your creator, Heavenly Father. Pure, blameless, and free from accusation. I love that phrase, free from accusation. I think one of the things that plagues so many of us is that the sins of our past continue to to accuse us and condemn us in so many ways. We can't move beyond them. We say things like, well, if you knew my past, you would know why God can't forgive me or, or I can't move beyond this addiction or I can't move beyond the mistakes of my past. It says here in scripture that through Christ, you are now free from accusation. You can no longer accuse yourself because God has forgiven you. But more importantly, God does not accuse you anymore and he does not condemn you for the sins of your past. In fact, your sins in Christ are forgiven past, present, and future. Did you guys know that Satan in the Old Testament is known as the accuser? And in both in the book of Daniel and in the book of Revelation, Satan, God's arch enemy, as described in the Bible, is described as the accuser. It it, it sets up as if he is the lead prosecutor in a courtroom at the throne room of God. And his job is to bring the souls before God and accuse them of their wrongdoing before God. That's his job. That's what Satan wants to do to you. And that's what he wants to do to me. He wants to accuse us and try to condemn us before God. But Colossians 1 says that the good news of the gospel is that we don't stand before God accused and condemned anymore. We stand before God pure and blameless, as it says, holy in his sight. And you and I can stand before Jesus pure and blameless because of how he has saved us. As you and I stand before this Jesus, what is your response? Where is this Jesus placed in your life today? Is he on the sideline? Is he in the background? Is he in the back seat? At your core, is Jesus Christ your Savior? And is he your Lord? Is he in complete control? What I mean by that is, does Jesus inform how you treat your family and friends? Does Jesus direct your steps every single day? 
Is Jesus and God's word the highest moral and spiritual authority over your life? Is, is God's will the only will that you're pursuing with your hopes and dreams? Is Jesus not only the one who has saved you, but is he also your Lord? Maybe the reason why you're carrying the weight and the shame of your mistakes is because he's not your savior yet. Maybe the reason your attempt at morality and spirituality is failing because you're you're looking at God and life's most critical answers in all the wrong places. Maybe the reason why your marriage or your life or your addictions is, is falling apart because Jesus is not Lord over it all. See, our hope is in Him. Our lives are to be surrendered fully to Him. And so as we enter into a new year, as we walk into 2021, our first message of the year, let's stand before Him in awe in such a way that we bow our knee to the supremacy of Jesus Christ and say, my life is yours. My life is in your hands. All that I am and all that I have I surrender fully to you, Jesus, as my Savior and my Lord. So as we we wrap this up and as you think about the rest of our time, the rest of your time throughout this day, just continually ask yourself, how is Jesus Lord over all of my life? And if you have never yet said yes to giving your life to Jesus, that can happen at any moment in your heart of hearts through the gift of prayer. You can just say simply, God, I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and I surrender it all to Him. And the scriptures say that when we make that declaration before God, we start a new journey as His child, fully forgiven, free of accusation, now that we have the power of the Holy Spirit living within us. That's the gift of salvation that God is offering to you. That's the gift of surrender that the scriptures offer to every single one of us. I'm going to close this in prayer and then I'm going to hand this off to Pastor Jason for our communion. Will you pray as we close scriptures together? Jesus, we thank you that you have the supremacy over it all. Whether or not we we choose to believe in this truth or not, that that is the truth. And we thank you that that our lives are, are not our own, that we are actually not in control. You're in control. And we thank you for the wonderful gift of surrender. We thank you for the wonderful gift of salvation that you have offered to every single one of us. We thank you that you are our creator. That your hands hold our lives together. That through the power of the cross and the resurrection, you can save our lives. You did it all. May our lives live in response, in obedience, and the pursuit of Jesus Christ because of who you are and what you have done in our lives. Lord, in the best way we know how, we surrender to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm going to hand off now as we get ready to to have communion together um, online. And so if you haven't already got your communion elements, please go and get those real quick. And uh, I'm going to hand this off to Pastor Jason as he closes out our service, leading us all through the wonderful gift of remembering Jesus Christ as our Savior. God bless you. Hey guys, I hope as we had the opportunity to hear our first core value um, of this new year that you were encouraged by that and that you were um, inspired by that and challenged to really develop that core value in your own life as a follower of Christ. What we're going to do to close out our time this morning is we're going to take some time to celebrate communion. And communion is a really, uh, uh, just a really unique and special opportunity for us as followers of Christ to remember a significant moment in the life of Christ and a significant moment in the lives of his disciples that he was gathered with for the Last Supper. I want to read this passage of scripture to you that explains the purpose of communion. And it's from uh, the translation called The Message. And I chose to read it from The Message today because I think it's just a... Uh, um, just a really practical way of, of reading through Scripture and just hits really close to home. So I'm reading this from 1 Corinthians, and these are the words of Paul, and this is the message that he's passing on to the church of Corinth about the value and the importance of communion. And this is what it says in chapter 11. It says, Let me go over with you again exactly what goes on in the Lord's Supper and why it's so centrally important. I received my instructions from the Master himself and passed them on to you. 
The master, Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, took bread. Having given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body broken for you. Do this to remember me. And after supper, he did the same thing with the cup. This, is cup, this cup is my blood, my new covenant with you. Each time you drink this cup, remember me. What you must solemnly realize is that every time you eat this bread and every time you drink this cup, you reenact in your words and actions the death of the master. And you will be drawn back to this meal again and again and again until the master returns. Guys, this is an opportunity for us to remember what Christ did on the cross for us. This is an opportunity for us to proclaim and celebrate solemnly what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us. And I think now more than ever, we really need to make sure that we understand that the hope of this world, the hope of our life, is obviously not in mankind. The hope of the world is in Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made on the cross so that we may be forgiven, so that we may be cleansed and purified in the eyes of the Lord, and we may have personal relationship with God the Father. That's what Jesus' death on the cross enables us to have, personal relationship with God the Father. So what communion does is it remembers uh, the act of Christ on cross with the bread representing his body and the juice representing his blood. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the bread together. And I'm going to use this handy-dandy little packet that we're giving out to everyone that's hanging out with us live on Sundays. But let's do this. Let's take the bread. And as we take the bread together this morning, let's remember that this is Jesus' body that was willingly broken and sacrificed for you and I. And next we're going to take the cup. And remember, the cup signifies that Jesus went to the cross and freely allowed his blood to be shed for us. So let's take the cup remembering Jesus' sacrifice again so that we may be forgiven and have a relationship with the Father. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much that as a father, you allowed your son to be the sacrifice for us. You allowed your beloved son, your beloved child to be the sacrifice for your other children so that we may be forgiven so that we, we may be made new again, that we may be restored, and that our relationship with you could be restored and rebuilt. And we thank you so much, and we praise you. And then we remember that act on the cross today as we take this bread and as we take this juice and the significance of it and the value of it and the importance of it. And Lord, may we never take it for granted. May we never, may we never view communion as commonplace or familiar. May it move us every time. And may we use it as an act of not only remembrance, but proclamation that you are who Scripture says you are, and your son is who Scripture says he is, and, and he did on the cross what Scripture says that he, did, that he did. We thank you for that, Lord, and we pray these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, guys, we are just really grateful and humbled that you chose to hang out with us today online. We hope that we will see you next week. Again, if there's any information that you'd like from us or you'd like to give to us, text Catalyst SP to 97000, and we'll get back to you as quickly as we can. We love you guys. God bless. We'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.